Welcome to lecture number four. Today's topic will cover a wide range of different issues dealing with the history of the United States at or about 1900. There are a few themes to be addressed in this lecture. First, we'll investigate daily life for many people in the United States at the turn of the previous century. Life for African Americans, immigrants, and farmers are just a few of the groups to be discussed. Next, we'll look at domestic politics of the 1890s eventually leading up to the presidential election of 1896. Finally, foreign policy will be addressed as we explore the Spanish-American War. We will begin the core of this lecture by investigating the economic situation faced by many African Americans during this era. A good place to begin is with some statistics addressing the black population of the United States. In 1900, almost 9 million African Americans lived in the nation. An overwhelming majority of those lived in the American South. Below is a hyperlink to some census data offering additional information on this subject. In the 1870s, as many as maybe 15,000 African American families became exodusters as they left the Deep South and moved to Kansas in order to establish homesteads of their own. The reason why there weren't more of these families is because it took a lot of resources in order to make this journey. So most black families lived in the South and they faced the economic situation of being sharecroppers. This developed as a compromise of sorts between former slaves and landowners in the years after the Civil War. There were a variety of characteristics associated with sharecropping in the American South. Typically, landowners would subdivide their plantations into 50-acre plots. An individual family would be responsible for raising crops, usually cotton, on those 50-acre segments. Secondly, because sharecroppers had very little money, they usually would give 50% or half of their crop as rent in return for the use of the land. This map of the Barrow Plantation from before and after the Civil War demonstrates the different land uses of a plantation. On the left, we see a large plantation, including slave quarters, from 1860. In 1881, we see the same plantation. However, it's subdivided into different plots for Sabrina Dalton and Lizzie Dalton in the upper right. And then we see Frank Maxey, Joe Bug, Jim Reed, Nancy Pope, and many others in those 50-acre plots on the right. In the Deep South, about three-quarters of the land was sharecropped. By the way, most black families were sharecroppers, but there were a significant number of white families who also sharecropped the land. This map provides a visual aid demonstrating the percentage of sharecropped farms by county in the American South by the late 1800s. In most communities, sharecropping was combined with another economic system called crop lien. This very often involved merchants advancing sharecroppers a variety of different supplies on credit. Sharecroppers would need seed, tools, maybe even livestock or furniture. How about some food in order to survive until their crops came in? The problem was that the interest rates were incredibly high because sharecroppers didn't have any collateral. They might pay as much as 50% in interest for the products that they received. The problem with this economy based on sharecropping and crop lien was that it very often created a cycle of indebtedness poor whites as well as blacks were very often unable to escape. As we see from this visual aid on the right, this is a store owner's record of debts by a variety of different sharecroppers. <laughs> 
This table demonstrates literacy rates in the American South in the years after the Civil War. As you can see from this table, large numbers of black Americans as well as whites were illiterate in states like South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana. This only added to the economic woes facing people who were sharecroppers. While there were more white sharecroppers than black, by 1900, 75% of all southern blacks lived as sharecroppers. Thus far, the lectures focused on the economic situation facing many African Americans at the turn of the century. We'll now explore the system of segregation in the United States and its legal basis. The court case Plessy v. Ferguson was one of the most important and controversial rulings ever handed down by the Supreme Court. It involved a law in the state of Louisiana that required that all railroad cars be segregated on the basis of race. A man by the name of Homer Plessy sued and he claimed that this was an equal treatment under the law. Eventually, the Supreme Court issued a ruling in 1896. By an eight to one margin, the Supreme Court ruled that separate facilities for people of different races were legal, as long as they were equal in quality. This gave us the so-called separate but equal doctrine. That separate but equal ruling allowed local communities to pass their own segregation laws. These were called Jim Crow laws, and they established legalized segregation all over the United States, whether it be in the South, the North, the West, or the East. And just about everything was segregated. Hospitals, theaters, courtrooms, schools, cemeteries, and many other items. On the right, we see an image from a little bit later in the 20th century, but what we see is a Coca-Cola dispenser, and they're encouraging people to purchase their product. However, white customers only. Black Americans also had to be concerned about violence, or at least the threat of violence, with organizations like the Ku Klux Klan or the White League, as shown in these images here. Violence against black Americans was a real concern, as these statistics from the late 1800s and early 1900s show. Below is a hyperlink to the Jim Crow Museum. I would encourage people who are interested in this subject to click on the hyperlink and find additional information. The next topic to be explored will be immigrant life in the United States in 1900. I think the best way to approach the issue of immigration is to first look at some statistics. Between 1840 and 1860, about 4 million immigrants entered the United States. Between 1860 and 1890, this had jumped to 10 million. Between 1890 and 1920, 18 million immigrants entered the United States. And one of the things that's interesting about this latter period is that these were so-called new immigrants, immigrants from eastern and southern regions of Europe. This figure demonstrates the so-called changing face of American immigration from 1865 to 1920. During the first 50 years or so of this, we see that immigration is dominated by so-called old immigrants, people coming from northern and western Europe. Later, in the orange areas, we see so-called new immigrants from Italy, Greece, maybe even parts of Russia or eastern Europe. In some cases, new immigrants and old immigrants clashed. In order to process these increasing numbers of immigrants arriving in the United States, a new location was opened in 1892. This was called Ellis Island. It's a great place to visit if you have the opportunity, but if you don't, I've got a hyperlink below to the website. This map identifies the numbers of foreign-born whites versus native-born whites by county in the United States in 1910. Notice the yellow areas. Those are areas where fewer than 5% of the population was born outside of the United States. In the green and blue areas, those indicate that at least 50% of the people living in those counties were born outside of the United States. Look at states like Wisconsin, Minnesota, and maybe even North Dakota. Large numbers of immigrants moved into those areas.
As large numbers of immigrants entered the United States, we also see tremendous urban growth in the years after the Civil War. I'd particularly like to point out the growth of Chicago from a little bit less than 300,000 to almost 1.7 million, and New York from just under 1.5 million to about 3.5 million by 1900. Living conditions in these growing cities were very far from ideal. On the left, we see how city dwellers very often lived in tenement houses, which were often overcrowded and unsanitary. On the right, we see an actual photograph of a tenement home. As this image demonstrates, families in these projects lived under very cramped conditions and even strung clotheslines between different buildings in order to complete their laundry. Now we can investigate the background to domestic politics in the United States by looking at some of the conditions faced by farmers as well as the economic crisis that hit the nation in the 1890s. In the years after the Civil War, many people moved out west in order to establish their own farms. If you remember, as shown in lecture number two, things like the Homestead Act encouraged people to move west. Some people prospered, but many hadn't. Farmers faced a variety of different problems in the late 1800s as shown by this table. The green areas indicate where farmers had enough income in order to pay for their expenses. However, the pink area shows where their income fell short. Beginning in the mid-1880s, we see several years in a row where farmers didn't make enough money in order to pay their bills. In order to provide support for each other as they faced hard times, many farmers began to organize in a group. The name of that group was the Grange. The Grange was founded in 1867 by a member of the Department of Agriculture named Oliver Kelly. Their goal was to provide education and emotional support to farmers in the American West. They were very often angry at practices of the railroad. The railroad companies often gave discounts to large businesses and charged higher rates to farmers. By 1880, membership very often dropped when prices temporarily recovered, but they showed that farmers could be a potential political force in U.S. politics. The entire nation faced economic problems with the so-called Panic of 1893. In many ways, this was associated with the railroad industry, which had grown up until the 1890s, yet the growth slowed by that decade. By the end of 1893, over 74 railroads, several banks, and many businesses had failed. Unemployment was incredibly high, between 20 and 25 percent nationally. Many demonstrated their anger at the lack of government involvement to help by joining Coxey's army. He and a group of many others demanded that the government sponsor a system of public works in order to bring those unemployment levels down. They marched to Washington, D.C., however, he and many others were arrested for trespassing, and it disbanded. The Panic of 1893 was the worst economic depression to face the nation until the decade of the 1930s. Some were angry as the election of 1896 approached, with President Grover Cleveland, who took a hands-off approach to resolving the Depression. The election of 1896 was held in the backdrop of the failing economy. There were two major candidates who ran for the presidency in that year. The Democratic candidate in this election was William Jennings Bryan. He was a member of Congress from Nebraska and also quite young. He was only 36 years old. The base of his support came from many farmers, particularly those out west. He was popular among farmers due to his stance of free silver. This would increase the money supply and help people who were in debt. Farmers were often in debt, so that's why many farmers supported his candidacy. The Republican nominee was William McKinley. He was a veteran of the Civil War, a former congressman, and a two-term governor of Ohio. In opposition to Bryan's stance of free silver, he wanted the United States to maintain its support of the gold standard. In general, McKinley had the support of the business community as they feared what might happen if Bryan's policies were adopted.
They also agreed with McKinley's goal to maintain high tariffs to protect American manufacturers. Well, in the end, William McKinley won with a percentage of the popular vote of about 51%. Notice where Bryan had most of his support, the South as well as segments of the West. William McKinley was very strong in the Northeast, the Great Lakes, and in California and Oregon. The lecture's focus will now switch to some of the key issues surrounding the nation's foreign policy of this era. We'll begin with some background to the Spanish-American War. The Spanish-American War took place in 1898, and as the title would suggest, it was fought between the Americans and Spain. However, the controversy between the two countries really was over conditions faced in Cuba. Cuba was a Spanish colony, and the American people were very sympathetic to the Cubans as they were fighting a revolution against this colonial power. The President of the United States during this time was William McKinley. Now, the reason why the American people even knew about what was going on in Cuba is because of the so-called yellow press. These were a series of journalists who often stretched the facts in order to sell newspapers. There were two major newspapers, the New York World and the New York Journal, who were engaged in a titanic duel of circulation as they tried to sell newspapers to the American people. They began to report many of the atrocities, some of which were true, some of which weren't, which were taking place in Cuba. The New York World was run by Joseph Pulitzer, and the New York Journal was operated by William Randolph Hearst. While the media sparked American interest in events going on in Cuba, it was the sinking of an American battleship, the USS Maine, in February of 1898 that led to actual fighting. The Maine was located in Havana Harbor, as shown in this map, in early 1898 when an explosion rocked the ship. At the time, it was believed that the Spanish had mined the harbor, causing the deaths of over 200 Americans. However, it's now believed that an internal explosion, probably from the boiler room, was the cause of the Maine's demise. But at the time, the true cause of the explosion was unknown. Combat took place in both the Philippines and Cuba. Under the direction of Admiral Dewey in May of 1898, U.S. forces steamed into Manila Bay and either captured or destroyed all ten Spanish ships at the cost of only one American life. U.S. troops then occupied Manila by mid-August. In the words of John Hay, this was a splendid little war. It was a splendid little war for a variety of reasons. First of all, a new hero had emerged. His name was Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt had led a volunteer group of forces to victory at San Juan Hill. The war itself only lasted six weeks. The Americans won, and, as a result of American involvement in this war, the United States had acquired a vast overseas empire. This map identifies several areas outside of the contiguous United States that were acquired by the U.S. in the late 1800s. The best examples as a result of the Spanish-American War would include the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico. Some may have described this as a splendid little war, however all war comes with some level of cost. Fewer than 400 Americans died in combat, but over 5,000 died from disease or other ailments. American involvement in the Spanish-American War demonstrated that the U.S. military was woefully unprepared. The U.S. was acting like many other European nations with its acquisition of territory like the Philippines or Puerto Rico. However, some argued that this violated the principles of the Declaration of Independence, upon which the United States had been formed in the late 1700s. Now that the core of the lecture has been completed, we can review some of the main issues which were discussed. Well, this lecture has covered a lot of different topics, one of which was daily life. 
Life was difficult for many immigrants and farmers at the turn of the century. However, black Americans very often faced sharecropping and legalized segregation. By 1900, the United States was emerging from its economic depression, but it had also become an imperial power, which set the stage for American growth throughout the 20th century. Well, this concludes Lecture 4 for this class, The United States at 1900. I hope you learned something new today. The next few slides will show some of the sources used for this lecture, as well as some additional hyperlinks to find more information on these topics. Have a great day.